quick overview of the presentation that we're going to go through. We want a quick motivation to say why do we want to play around with allocators at all. Then we're going to use specifically the allocator model we use in Bloomberg as a motivation for why we wanted to do something beyond what was available in C++03. So having walked through our how we try and use allocators, we'll highlight how, how that turned out to be a problem with the existing standard, how we fixed that in C++11, and then some experience about implementing and using the C++11 model. And the two yellow parts are the, the, the larger parts of the presentation. So we'll start with a question, just trying to figure out where the motivation is. What is an allocator? An allocator is simply a mechanism that's going to supply you memory on demand. Um, and typically, it should be an implementation detail of your object that says, okay, I need memory, I, I want to get memory from somewhere. Typically, you know, this is what an allocator does, and typically it means you're thinking in terms of a container, but containers aren't the only things that might use allocators unless you have a very liberal definition of the term container. And the goal for Bloomberg is we want to be able to, on a per object basis, say, this is the right allocator for you. I know the context of the code that you're calling from, and I, I can maybe use something more specific than just new and delete. So we want to be able to, for each object in our system that can use an allocator, be able to supply it an allocator efficiently and easily. And if we're not too worried about the constraints of this particular part of our program, we shouldn't have to do that. It should be able to pick up an easy default and just do the right thing. So we worry about allocators only where they're going to bring us a real benefit and we know we're using them. So that's the goal of where we're trying to get to. And that's clicking the wrong way. So some motivating examples for where having a specific allocator can be helpful. Um, thread specific allocators. I'm writing some code that's only going to work within a single thread. I don't want to go out to a new that might have some kind of contention with synchronizations and locks managing global memory across a system. News are getting better. But even so, if I know I'm absolutely never exchanging that memory, why do I want to run the risk of having any synchronization there going to the allocator at all? Pooled allocators are kind of in that, an optimization in that similar kind of space. Stack-based allocators are kind of the ultimate expression of an allocator that's only going to allocate memory available to a single thread because it's mostly coming from your stack. And this has a few other benefits as well. I'll be using that as an example later on. Uh, big use case for me specifically is I write a lot of test drivers and having a being able to plug in an, allo an instrumented allocator on each object to see how it's using memory rather than globally instrumenting new and delete. I get to track memory leaks or memory misuse on a per object level throughout my test driver. And that turns out to be very useful. And the final example we have in the motivating list is allocators in shared memory. So something like the Boost shared memory, um, I can't remember the name of the library now, but the, the shared memory containers library. Turns out that for the Bloomberg model, that's a lot harder because you need to have special pointers coming out for your shared memory. And our model works with in-memory pointers. So we can do this as long as we constrain our shared memory segments to always load into the same region of memory every, in every process. So for C++11, we want to be able to solve all of these problems, not necessarily just the Bloomberg problems, which is where we'll get to. So within the Bloomberg model, which, as I say, I'm going to use as my motivation examples throughout most of the presentation. We solve the problem of saying, what happens if I don't supply an allocator with a notion of the default allocator? This is just a global allocator available throughout the system that by default we'll call new and delete. We call it the new delete allocator. Um, for a specific program, if you control main, you can install a different default allocator, such as you might want a test allocator to check there's no memory leaks throughout your program. So you install that at the top of a test driver and that's a really handy just um, default. Any, t any time any allocator, in any object in your system wants an allocator, it'll get the default, which will be now our test allocator. And then we'll get reports about leaks at the end of the program, unless a specific allocator is used elsewhere in that test driver. So, so to put this into a bit more context, we'll think about a specific allocator design. And this is one of our favorite allocators. We call it the buffered sequential allocator. And the idea is we want to ideally allocate memory off the stack of my, uh, my current thread. So we'll give the allocator an array of a certain size. It will know both. And that will ideally be an array allocated on the stack. And the allocator can now just every request for new allocate sequentially off that buffer until it runs out. Uh, when we go to release memory, our delete, delete operation is a no operation. 
This is what the sequential implies. We're just going to keep consuming memory and we never hand it back to the system. Which if we, ha within certain constraints is a very help. Within the constraints of our call, if we know that we're working within a bounded region of memory, this is a reasonable optimization. And finally, if we do exceed the memory in the buffer, we'll have a fallback allocator that can allocate another buffer, probably twice the size of the first one to give us some slack, and we can carry on with the same idiom. So as long as we get that initial allocation size correct off the stack, this, is, this can be very efficient. Uh, we don't. It's your job to, to create the array on the stack yourself and supply it to the allocator. So, yes, I'm afraid that becomes your responsibility of making sure you don't break the stack yourself and working with whatever your environment is and what, what tools and help and support that might have. I say it, it's a motivating example. This is. I've gone the wrong way on my buffers again. So, the obvious benefit is we're thinking in terms of um, effect, efficient memory allocation. Does anyone have any other suggestions as to what benefits this kind of allocator is buying us? In what, what way am I getting performance? Okay, so yes, there's no synchronization involved here, almost ever, unless we go to that global that default backup allocator and that might do a synchronization, but even that will be relatively rare. So less synchronization. Any other ideas about optimizations we get from this or improved performance? So some of the management process is simpler, yes. Yep, we've got a good look at reference because everything's coming from a, a single array. Given that we're trying to optimize around a specific function, can be quite handy. That's not the job of the allocator because the destructor ha handles more than memory management and the allocator doesn't know that. So, mm -hmm. I, yeah, so I, I run the destructor, but I don't, yes, yeah, so the memory management side of it is just a no operation. Yeah, so we've got simplified bookkeeping. Okay, the last, well, sorry, the last example I was thinking of was low memory fragmentation, because you're always off the stack, you're not, there's no chance of fragmenting your heap unless you've really got that initial estimate wrong. And for long running processes, a lack of fragmentation can be a real benefit. So, you know, there's a real reason for us wanting to be able to use smarter allocators. Um, there's some risks here as well. Because this is coming off our stack, the, it's not safe generally to exchange this memory or the objects using this memory between multiple threads. So keep your... As long as you're running within a single thread, it's a good optimization. But be aware that you've got this kind of a risk and don't use this allocator if it's not appropriate to your use model. You want to be able to pick different allocators. It doesn't work very well with a lot of allocation and release cycles. Because our delete is just an operation and the next allocation is going to just keep consuming from that buffer. So if you're on an allocate, release, allocate, release, allocate, release kind of algorithm, this is a very poor allocator to choose. Another issue there is something like, say, I've got a vector where I'll, I'll push, 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 and at some point it's going to have to grow. When it grows, it's going to allocate some more memory from that same allocator, move the elements across, and that early memory is just dead memory now. So if you're using an, um, a data structure that's going to do lots of internal data management like this, it might not be a good fit. But assuming this isn't in your, a problem for your current scope and you know what you're dealing with, can be a very good choice. So, John. Allocate the vector and never delete it and just let the allocator go out of scope. 
this is a kind of managed allocator, and the cost of getting into memory is almost zero. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But you can't do it. It's not the allocator. Well, it is because it's a managed allocator, and you can simply not destroy the vector, and then you're good. Hitting the wrong button. So, say typical use cases for this kind of um, an allocator. I was thinking you're know, building a string where I'm sequentially going to, I can reserve the size of the string in advance and build up within that buffer and then return the, the string out of the function in some way. Or compute a function over associated range on small value, uh, small and associated values on a small range. So, I can say, okay, I'm going to need this certain size working area, you know, allocate that vector, supply the elements, do my algorithm and get it out. That temporary working space is very efficiently handled with this kind of allocator, as long as I've got a fair clue in advance as to just how much memory I'll need. So I have an example of how we might write code using such an allocator. Uh, it's, can we move that across the screen? Uh, unfortunately, I'm running full screen. <coughs> That's just about gutters, yep. So. So I've got a bit, bit of random color coding going on throughout here, but you'll, you'll see a lot of blue and yellow, too, which are highlighting generally slightly different things on the same slides. So the first thing we're going to do is, you know, at the top tells us we're going to allocate memory, we're going to have a buffer for the size of 300 doubles. So we would create a, a memory array, a char array, a buffer of the right size, and they're using C++11 here to say align it as if it's storing doubles to make sure it's got the correct alignment on the stack. Um, just take my next slide. Uh, within the BDE libraries in C++03, we've got a slightly different way we do that. We've got a utility class, but this is just simpler for the slide. Then, and as you can see, uh, we're aligning as double and we'll be creating vectors of double. So we want to make sure the memory aligns appropriately in the two places. Next, we create our buffered sequential allocator, which is our allocator object. And we pass it the buffer and the size of the buffer. That's not deduced because in this case, we've got a, an array. But the general case is we're using one of our utility classes. So you see here, here's the start of your memory, and this is how much you've got. The allocator no, now knows the arena it's working with. Then we are going to construct our three vectors. And you notice we pass the address of the allocator object. We're not passing a copy. This is very important because the model is, you'll see the vector itself doesn't say what type of allocator it's dealing with. This is the model we're trying to get to. We call it the polymorphic model. Uh, all our allocators have a base class in common, which we'll see very shortly. So we pass in the pointer to the base class. And now the vector knows how to manage the object. And then just to make sure that we don't have any of those internal reallocations within the vector, common usage of dealing with this kind of allocator, we're going to reserve sufficient space. And then we can get on and do our work. We know that as we populate these vectors, as long as we don't bust the space we've reserved for them, we should be good to go. There is one slight risk with this if you don't know your standard library implementation. Can anyone see it? Just so I'm not pulling the blinds over anyone's eyes. Sorry. Yes. Uh, I've assumed, if I go back a slide, that those allocating 100 will not try and round up to some other nicer buffer number that the individual vectors think will work better. The assumption is that those will, allocate, will reserve exactly 100 elements and no more. But if you know your library, that can be a reasonable assumption. And I say, if you've got it wrong, the end result is well, the final vector will probably end up going back to an, a, a, another buffer on the heap that it will be separately allocated by our main allocator. So even if we've got that wrong, it's a predictable gra uh, gradual failure that is not going to cause us problems. That's I can't remember, John, do we? 
So to clarify the question, the question is, can I go to the allocator and ask, how much memory have you allocated to how much space do you have left? Because that seems to be an important property of these buffered sequential allocators. And the answer is, out the box, the buffer sequential allocator doesn't offer that, but it's very easy to write an allocator adapter that I can plug the buffer sequential allocator into, which I would then use as my main allocator here if I wanted to go back and do that querying. So the system's very composable, but you don't pay for more. This is not STD vector, this is BSL vector. You'll be seeing shortly um, what we've done here. The idea is we've got our own allocator type that was going to wrap any allocator that we passed to it. So we've got, rather than we've got BSL vector, which is essentially STD vector with the BSL allocator rather than STD allocator as the default allocator. And that's essentially the only difference. There might be a couple of uh, constructor overloads that also take pointers, but I think they all actually take the the implicit conversion into the BSL allocator to pick up the point, the allocator that we're passing. Actually, I'll, I'll be using BSL allocator itself as one of our main examples later on. So, yep. Okay, so can you ask that question when I've presented the next slide? Because th this is introducing where it becomes the right time to ask that question. So the important thing for us is, here is the notion of what we call vocabulary types. When you are passing types between your functions in, in your API, you really want to have a single type to represent the same thing. So that if I'm passing a string around, I don't want to pass different strings if I'm using different allocators. Or uh, the alternative is suddenly all my functions have to become function templates to come up with the fact that the string objects I'm passing might be having different allocators bound at compile time. Because with C++03, the allocator is a physical part of the type. It's your third or second template parameter. So uh, if I did this in a strictly C++03 manner saying let's use compile time allocators, it means that my ability to pass these things into functions by reference taking their pointer, they're not going to be compatible. So I, um, Ahmed's suggestion was if I want to be able to solve problems like operator equal equal between two vectors, I could solve that by just uh, enhancing the operator equal equal function template to compare vectors of different allocators. But that's only a small part of the problem. It's not just comparing these things. It's the ability to pass them through APIs. So we want to have a single vocabulary type for vector, for string, for all these different types that I can seamlessly pass through my APIs but give each one a different allocator at runtime depending on the context they came from. This is a very big deal for us. The file system API is... So yeah, the, the fundamental problem is banning at compile time makes for, for poor vocabulary for us. You think of what the allocator does. Its job is to supply memory. Memory doesn't really depend upon the type that you're supplying memory for. It's just give me that many bytes. So there's no, in principle, that my allocator should depend upon type. So again, containers need allocators. Containers shouldn't be part of the type. This our string is our example. So we produce this, which is getting very hard to read in the, uh, the, the light we have now. This is our basic allocator class. We're looking at the, um, uh, the, the basic declaration. The heart of it is these two virtual functions here. You've got a basic interface class, um, classic Java style interface. It's two virt pure virtual functions, and every allocator is just going to implement these two. <coughs> 
you allocate, you say I need this many bytes, and it returns you a pointer. It's up to you to cast that pointer to what you wanted it to be. Because you know what you're at, you will know what you're allocated from your context. Likewise, when you release memory, you pass in the address that the allocator gave you, and then it's the allocator's job to do its cleanup with that, depending on what's appropriate for that allocator. But this is the basis of everything that we need an allocator to do. And um, we can now wrap this in something that gets even smaller and harder to read. The key part of this slide was just the two parts I had highlighted in blue and yellow. Which, do we have a laser pointer? Can't see. Uh, right at the top, the first thing you can see, if we go back to the previous slide, ah, this is not a template. BSL allocator T, T, which is what you will be instantiating our containers with, you will notice is a template. But this template is wrapping in yellow a pointer to our allocator, which is, then becomes the data member of the allocator object itself. So our allocators are going to have state, which is a single pointer value. Yes, they're typed, but they're going to have the same type parameter as the, cont as the container itself, so we're not inducing extra type dependencies there. And we can therefore use lots of different allocators plugged into here, because the allocator mechanism itself isn't based on type. That, this is our motivation for trying to get to the C++11 stuff, which I'm also trying to move along to. But this, this is essentially our model. Each object will use its most appropriate allocator, given its context. We pass the allocator by address, not by value. We don't make copies of these things. The address is how we get in the dynamic dispatch. And the container doesn't own its allocator. So you must ensure that lifetimes nest. If we just jump back up to the original example here, here we have the allocator, there we have the containers. And the lifetime guarantees match, everything's nice. If you're passing things around by pointer, people tend to worry, what's the lifetime concerns here? Well, the container doesn't own the pointer. So as long as the container's lifetime is less than that of the allocator, and this is your typical use case, allocator above the container within a function, it's a, it's a very simple, safe model to use built upon C++ lifetimes already. Yes? So yes, we, we are doing a virtual function dispatch, but compared to the typical cost of a memory allocation, a virtual function dispatch is generally much more efficient than the things we're, other, we're saving otherwise paying. There's no free lunch. Question at the back. Sorry, I've, I've asked to repeat the question. Um, the question is, am I, was I concerned about the cost of this being a virtual function where I'm making a dynamic dispatch here? And the answer was that, in general, the cost you're saving by having the more specific allocator way outweighs the cost of the virtual function call. Question at the back. Yes. That's the model we use within BDE at the moment. Yes. The question was, uh, we don't see construct and destroy when I come down to our allocator here. Uh, we've actually got um, a funny delete object function, but it's not quite the same thing. Um, within, within our library, we've got a different set of facility we do to do the placement new. And it's a little bit more advanced than the placement new, but our containers are calling that. When we look at how we get to this in C++11, you'll see the allocators are picking that up. So, as I say, this is motivation. This is what we do today. If you look at our open source library that we're trying to celebrate, you'll find this is how we're doing it today. If you look at the proposal we had for in the pre-meeting mailing for the last standards meeting, you'll find there's a slightly different way of proposing it there that works better with the model that went into C++11. I think this is an important point, so let me just take 30 seconds. Well, we're running low. Think about a vector. Think about a vector. Uh, if a vector's going to get to have a billion elements, that'll mean 30 virtual function calls. In the course of doing that, it'll have to copy one, then two, then four, then eight, and so on elements. By the time you get to a billion, those 30 virtual function calls are meaningless. They're not even measurable. So that's, that's the first point. And, and the second point is, in this particular case, we're doing it once. We're allocating 100 bytes right off the top, and then we're done. So we really can't be too worried about it. So catching up with where I was up to. So yeah, this is the basic model. Pass the allocator by, by pointer into the container.
then the container can then use the appropriate allocator you've supplied for it. If you don't supply one by default, we'll use whatever the global default for the application as specified in main was. If we don't specify one in main, we have what we call the new delete allocator, which is a simple allocator that defaults to new and delete, or operator new and operator delete. Some other consequences that fall out of our model. Um, we've got this notion that our allocators do not propagate, which is one of the more inter interesting parts that comes out of this, because if you've not dealt with stateful allocators, the, the question never arises. But once your allocators start having state, the question becomes, I've got a vector, and I'm I've got a string, and I'm assigning it to another string, and they've got different allocators installed in them. Should the allocator propagate with the copy or not? And uh, there's various answers suggesting b both different directions, and our experience was very much that you create, you instill an allocator when you create your object, you've told this object, this is where I'm going to for my memory. And there's no real mechanism in C++ to change that. You can query the allocator, but there's no set or change allocator function. But the, uh, the semantics for operate, the assignment operator and maybe the swap operation weren't so clear. So we've got this notion of propagation. And the BDE model is allocators never propagate. You, the property of your allocator, you instill when you, of your container, you, inst create, you instill when you create it. It knows where it's going to for its memory. And that's where it's going through throughout its lifetime. So good question, so what do we do about move assignment? And in our case, if the allocator doesn't propagate, the move assignment turns into a copy. But you're getting slightly ahead of where I am within the uh, slides. There's a, an extra feature for why that becomes a copy. So copy construction will use, as a consequence of this, um, not propagating, we also believe that copy constructor will use the default allocator and not the allocator of the object you're copying from. Now, it's slightly different under move construction. With move construction, we really do want to preserve we've efficiently created this object using this allocator. And for a construction, it really does kill us to um, make a duplicate copy at that point. You're giving up the whole reason of the move construction. There's a reason I'll come back for why move assignment is different. Could I just ask you a question? If you have the same allocator, And yes, if the same allocator is on both sides, it is an efficient move. It's only when they're different allocators that the... The problem arises. All the time, that you're doing. You would never do it in any other way. So just note that it sounded very scary. Oh, we gave up the move assignment. No, we didn't. Because in all cases where they're the same, there's no issues. Only when they're different. But they would be different for a reason. That doesn't come up. Specifically, you do not want allocators to propagate when you have shared memory. I'll be talking about that later when I go into the more C++11 slides rather than the Bloomberg slides. This is the end of how we got, came up with the model we produced and how that affected the, um, the model that went into C++11. Note the C++11 model isn't the Bloomberg model. It's a much more general model that can support many models, but specifically will support ours as one of those realizations. So another consequence of the... Um, not propagating in allocators is we can't swap two containers unless they have the same allocator because otherwise you've, you, you're trying to exchange ownership of bad, different memory resources. And generally that becomes undefined behavior. And I'm this, this is possibly not a good thing for some people, especially if you think of the general swap function where the general swap function doesn't have any undefined behavior in it. And if we're spontaneously to say, containers have undefined behavior when you swap them if their allocators don't match. That's not such a good thing. And we've got actually an open issue in the C++ standard that currently says that's what happened. But in principle, what, what we should be doing there is saying if you're swapping two containers and they have different allocators, you make a copy using the right allocator and swap those. So it's slower because you're making two copies and then swapping those two copies with the appropriate containers. But it should be well-defined behavior. For the member swap operation, on the other hand, that's specifically an optimization to say, I know that I'm dealing with this container. I'm not doing the, gen the generic swap thing. And in that case, we do say it's undefined behavior to swap two containers that have different allocators. So um, I don't spend too much time on this because I do actually want to get onto the C++11 side of things. But this is one of those areas to be aware of that the co there's consequences that come from having allocated with state that may or may not propagate. 
And C++11 supports the ability for the allocator to specify whether or not you want it to propagate under these operations. But the default is they don't. And another part of our model is once you have a container, you want all the elements in the container to have the same allocator as the container. And this is very important, again, in the case of the shared memory allocator. Where if I have a vector of strings in shared memory, the vector in shared memory, I really want those strings in the same shared memory. Otherwise, I can't share them between different applications loading up that shared memory segment. So it becomes very important that once you have an allocator using this kind of a model, or a container using this kind of model, that the allocator propagates down into the elements. Unfortunately, that's overloading the term propagate, so we've got, the, uh, we've got the scoped model is what that ended up being called in C++11. I'm running a little late on my slides, so I'm running through just before I've had time for that to bake in quite as well as I would like to. In fact, I'm going to skip the next section, which was a worked example of the, um, the, the, uh, the pro allocator propagation, and get to how did this affect us with C++03. And this, as I say, it's why Bloomberg joined the Standards Committee, the original motivation, because we wanted to get our polymorphic model available in the standard. So, in the C++03 standard, there's the ability to use a compile time allocator. But, unfortunately, the, you know, the um, allocator forms part of the type. And our initial proposal to say, let's just get rid of that allocator type and do polymorphic everywhere, it was too late to fix that. So... We're resigned to that. So then we want to use something like our allocator adapter model that I was showing earlier, where we have the BSL allocator wraps the allocator mechanism so that everything can channel through the polymorphic allocator. That would work apart from the fact that C++03 allows the vendors to bend the rules and not quite respect stateful allocators if they don't want to. And the other feedback we got from the committee as we were going through this was, um, simple allocators are still too complex. If we're going to make it possible to write allocators, we, and we're going to get serious about it, this should be a lot simpler than it is today. So we'll start with what, what came to be known as the weasel words. These are the rules that mean that even though I can write a nice allocator adapter, or like the BSL allocator, it might not be supported. All instances of a given allocator type are required to be interchangeable. So all objects of the same allocator type have to be interchangeable and always compare equal to each other, saying they can allocate and release each other's memory. In other words, allocators can't have state, such as our allocator pointer. Vendors were encouraged to support that, but they could fall back on this weasel wording if they wanted to. They weren't required to support stateful allocators. And the other piece of weasel wording, type def members in the allocator, pointer, const pointer, size type, and difference type, uh, you can assume that they're T star, T con star, size T, and putter diff T. So no smart pointers to be returned by your allocator, which is what matters if you're trying to write a shared memory allocator, where you want to return some kind of off offset pointer into your shared memory segment rather than a raw pointer. So no smart pointers. So these were the things we wanted to fix with the C++11 model in order to be able to support different kinds of allocators that would therefore be useful to us. So the solution in C++11 is remove the weasel wording, yay! And in, we've introduced allocator traits as a way to make it much simpler to write and work with a variety of allocators. Allocator traits is a traits template that describes the customizable behavior of an allocator. And if you don't supply all the possible behavior, the allocator traits will synthesize the default for you. Uh, likewise, containers, therefore, don't go to the allocator to allocate memory. They will instead call a function of the allocator traits, passing it the allocator, along with the other arguments to say, this is what I want the allocator to do on my behalf. And that way, the allocator traits can synthesize the method if the allocator itself hasn't supplied it. So what do we have in allocator traits? Um, for, first of all, we have two type defs, allocator of the allocator type that... I have the traits for. It's kind of useful to, to be able to get back the original allocator. And we also have a, a type def value type to say this is what the allocator allocates. You'll notice that that is mandatory. Your allocator must supply that type def. Then we've got another bunch of type defs that are quite useful. Pointer, const pointer, void pointer, difference type, size type, with this wonderful magic phrase, see below. And we will see below on one of these later. 
But the idea is, if your allocator doesn't have a nested type def of that type, that, with that name, it's going to deduce an appropriate one for you. Likewise, we have the rebind feature. If I think, I'm, think in terms of implementing a node-based container like um, standard map, the elements I'm going to allocate aren't going to be with the allocator you supply me. You're going to supply me an allocator to say, this is how I allocate pair of key and value. But what I actually want to allocate is the node in the tree with the extra pointers that are storing the key and the value. So I'm going to actually be allocating my special node star, special node type, so I need to rebind to say I've got an allocator of this type, but I want an allocator of the same family that actually allocates something slightly different. So rebind alloc is how we get that, um, because you often end up going straight to the traits rather than the allocator. We also provide an e easy alias to get to the, the traits as well. Then we've got this notion of allocator propagation I was talking about earlier. Three separate traits here that we can um, specialize. They're essentially a type trait, so these should be uh, uh, aliasing to true type or false type. Let's say if I'm doing a copy assignment, a move assignment, or a swap, should I propagate the allocators in those circumstances? By default, these will all come to false, but if you're creating your own allocator, you can specialize these traits and say, no, I, I do want my allocator to propagate. And then we get some methods. So we've got some allocate calls, a deallocate call, construct and destroy, so that you have the ability for your allocator to intercept the attempts to construct your elements if you want to store any additional bookkeeping with them. And we'll have an example where that's quite useful coming shortly. And then max size, how, 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 big can, can my, how many elements can my allocator allocate? And the final trait for how we do this propagation, if I'm doing a copy construction, uh, we, we ask the allocator itself, give me the allocator I should use when I'm doing a copy construction. And by default, that will just be a copy of the allocator. In something like our model, we'll say, oh, no, you get the default allocator rather than a copy of me. That is essentially allocator traits. Turns out that getting some of those defaults, though, one, one traits class is never enough when you get going. We also have pointer traits that are useful when you're describing the kind of smart pointer that might be returned by an allocator, which reminds me, just going back here, the two things I had in blue and yellow, the allocate and deallocate calls work in terms of the smart pointer type. Construct and destroy, you're working in terms of a native pointer, and that's not a typo on the slide. But it turns out for construct and destroy, you want to default back to placement new and so forth. You're typically saying, by the time I'm constructing an element, I need the real memory address of where it's going to or being destroyed from. Whereas when I'm allocating and deallocating, I do need that to work with in terms of a smart pointer telling me how I'm navigating that other potentially shared memory or whatever the system it's coming from is. So what I'm doing next, I'm going to give a quick example of how we might implement one of the allocator type defs. So this is now jumping into the kind of stuff we're doing as implementers when it's time to implement allocator traits. And this is what your allocators will be doing under the hood in your containers as you start writing code using the new features. So basically, I'm trying to implement the size type, but, um, type def, and I'm going to be using some kind of spin eye trick to deduce that from what we have here. So last time, a few times I gave this, I was told by my audience to at least give a quick lesson in spin eye for folks who weren't overly comfortable with it. Who here is not comfortable with the term spin eye or doesn't know what I'm talking about here? Gives me an idea how quickly I run through these slides. Yeah, everyone seems perfectly happy. Great. So spin eye was this technique that we discovered or went into the language to support the ability to use templates in certain cases. If these things were hard errors, templates were unusable. And we then discovered we could um, use or abuse the feature to control overload resolution in a much more careful way in, in generic code. And in C++11, we made it even easier to abuse this by including the enable if template that just automates a lot of the machinery that you go through to try to exploit the spin eye tricks. So this, for example, is how I might deduce, do I have a pointer type in my um, allocator? And therefore, um, my, my smart pointer type should be either that pointer type or a pointer to the value type of the allocator. So first of all, I'll create two types, true type and false type that have different sizes. I'll create an a function I can overload called sniff pointer that will return true type or false type that will spin eye depending on whether or not I have a nested type def within that class. 
then finally I can write my has pointer trait that is true or false depending upon whether the size of the unevaluated expression, but it does go off and do the overload resolution, tells me which of these two types came out. And therefore I know whether or not type T actually has a nested uh, type called pointer. So now I can write something like this. Only there's a bug on this slide. If anyone can see the bug. So okay, now my allocator traits want to say I'm going to use the standard conditional type that says basically if I have pointer, I'm this type. And if I don't have the pointer type, I'm going to be that type. So I can be either the, the, a pointer to the value type or the nested pointer type, depending upon how that Boolean expression evaluates. Does anyone see the bug? Yes. This doesn't spin I. So even though I've done the check, this still has to pass. So what I actually end up doing is I'm, there's the error. Going the right way again. I end up creating yet another pair of <laughs> traits in order to pick out what is the right type. So I've got to delegate down to yet another pair of um, meta functions, which is all kind of snarly and unpleasant. And I don't want to be doing too much of this because we've got an awful lot of type depths we're going to deduce. Um, luckily, we've got some features in C++11 that make that easier. So the question is, this kind of spin eye technique, it's been known and around for years, the one I just demonstrated, but it has a problem where if the type therefore thing we're looking up is declared private, that's a hard error. It doesn't spin eye. Therefore, our program is just going to be mis fail to compile just trying to look for that symbol. And that's perfectly correct in C++03. In C++11, the spin eye conditions have been generalized. And they will include generalizing over if the access, look, access check fails, that's now a spin eye condition, and it will continue on and do the right thing. So that, in fact, is bullet number three. <laughs> bullet number one, we have decal type expressions, which are really handy, as we're about to see. We have late specified return types. So I can now write an expression where the return type is my decal type of something using arguments that were in the function signature itself. And alias templates are just a much more readable way to write some of these type defs, especially when the type defs look like they're turning into mini, mini programs of their own. So going back to how, I, how was I implementing my deduce function for size type, this is the thing where you saw I was having two pages worth of, function te of class templates to do all the type traits before. I'm going to say the type is decal type of dispatch to this function with my allocator. And whatever that type comes, doing this fin eye on the, these functions, I've auto automatically got the result. So I don't have to do those extra layers of indirection, which is nice. Only if you look at what the actual result for size type is, if my allocator has a size type, it's great. Otherwise, I have to make, make unsigned whatever the difference type of the allocator is, which means we're jumping into another lookup. But admittedly, this is already present for the difference type of the allocator, but it's another set of jumps I'm, hoops I'm going to jump through where I'll be either difference type if we support that. Otherwise, we're into that pointer traits I was talking about to say, you've got a smart pointer. What's the difference type of that smart pointer? And what do you know? That's yet another one of these funny meta functions where we've got to go off and say, what's the difference type of my smart pointer? Well, if it's a um, smart pointer with a difference type, I know that. Otherwise, I'm just going to assume it's, um, if it's a native pointer, it's whatever I get put a diff t, and I can get put a diff t with just subtracting two pointers. And finally, I get to the end of the chain. But that shows that if I don't define size type for my allocator, it will go down the chain of the different places it could find the right answer, and therefore pick up the most appropriate answer from the context that you have supplied. And eventually, you go all the way up and say, well, I assume you've got a raw pointer, and that the difference type is standard put a diff t. And this is a large part of simplifying writing allocators. Because unless you need to specialize one of these points, the allocator traits with all this metaprogramming will find it for you. And here's the other kind of 
place where this technique of doing the sphenai on decal type over an expression becomes very valuable. Because we've got the construct call to say, I want to construct this object with your allocator. If my allocator doesn't want to do anything special with construct, it shouldn't have to define it. So by default, do construct will say, I'll do an in place new of the, your object at this address, say construct you here, have perfect forwarding of all the arguments using variadic templates, done. On the other hand, if your allocator does support the construct call, I somehow need to sniff that out with this funky bit of sphenai at the top. So here's the expression that I want to know if it's valid or not. And I'm going to cast that to void. That way it's got the same return type in both places. So if this fails, if this doesn't sphenai out, this is going to be my uh, preferred expression. And if this does sphenai out, I get the correct one. Now, how have I, just trying to remind myself what I've done to make sure that I end up with the more specific case on top, because if they both match, I don't want an ambiguity. And we avoid that by void star will always be a lesser match than target type. So there is no ambiguity there if they both happen to be valid. And we're not paying for any extra dummy arguments, tag dispatch, or anything like that either. So this generalized spin eye and decal type have made this kind of metaprogramming much simpler for C++11. But I would really like something like Concepts, like to see if we can get something even easier here. It's still way too much work. So, end result of all that. How much easier is it to implement an allocator? This is STD allocator. This is STD allocator once we have allocator traits. Or, no, we still have the whole thing because we're not changing breaking code that used to rely on the old interface. But the gray stuff is just no longer necessary. The yellow stuff is noise that's in the standard allocator interface that was never actually used. So in the end, just the white stuff is all you need to implement if you're implementing a minimal allocator today. So you can see it's dropped a huge amount of boilerplate that's just no longer necessary. Bringing up, coming over to our specific example, how does this affect the Bloomberg allocator? Well, first of all, we're going to have this BSL, um, BSL allocator T that's wrapping our allocator pointer. And this is what drops out of our allocator. Uh, as you can see, we've got the same reference and um, address functions here. Turned out we were implementing a copy constructor that could be trivially defaulted. So, because when you copy one of these objects, you're just copying the address. But generally, I say we don't, we don't make the copies. So, we come down and look at how we were de declaring allocate before. And for some reason, I've got construct down there. We don't have a construct. But oh, sorry, yeah, this is on our existing wrapper, not the, um, the BSLMA allocator pointer. Um, that changes slightly in C++11. First of all, we're dropping the uh, pointer hint because as far as we can tell, no one ever uses it. The allocator traits will use the pointer hint to say allocate somewhere close to this if you can make use of the hint. But as far as we're aware, I've not yet seen an allocator that has used that. And when we asked at the last standards meeting if anyone had seen an allocator that used the hint, the answer was still a resounding zero. On the other hand, the construct and destroy methods you will notice are now actually parameterized on the pointer type that they take. So they don't just work with pointers to the specific allocator type. They'll be able to construct and destroy any pointer through that scheme. This is, again, a requirement of C++11. Just because rebinding allocators all the time when I just want to call construct and destroy was a bit of a headache on the user side, so we just made that simpler. So if we then turn, compare this to uh, the minimal allocator interface, this is essentially what we've added. Um, so this is our custom allocator. This is the kind of thing you're doing when you're making a custom allocator. We've got an additional constructor that takes, it's implicitly converting from a raw pointer, so we can just pass our allocator address and our allocator will pick that up without having to write lots of additional overloads that just work with our pointers. And we're going to store that internally because we're going to use that when we're doing the allocations. And we also have the ability to pull out that pointer from our allocator, so we need to have a function that will return that for us. And just for kicks, our allocator, as we said, does something slightly different on the on container property on the copy construction of a container. So we provide an implementation of the select on container copy construction that will return what we call the default allocator rather than a copy of this allocator. <laughs> 
So allocate, uh, Ahmed? So, well, so if you look at what we have here, this is the C++11 model. Unfortunately, the experience we have within Bloomberg is very much still with our C++03 model. So we've not had a chance to do compilation against more modern compilers that support the range of features. We're constrained by the uh, systems available to us in production at the moment. Um, feedback from Microsoft is they have noticed some comp degradation of compilation speed with this. Um, I'm yet to... Yes, so they found, you know, creating a specific specialization for the widely used common allocators like standard allocator brought them a compil compilation be benefit. Uh, I need to check with, um, I know John Wakeley's been implementing a lot of this for GCC recently, and of course Howard Hennant's done the same thing for um, libc++. I need to check with them if they've got any feedback experience about the um, compilation speed. I see a nice prompt to remind me that I forgot to repeat the question. So the question was, has there been, been any notion of um, degradation of compilation speed with this kind of a model in C++11? And is, you know, have we measured any of this? And part of the feedback was Microsoft, as a specific implementation, have noticed a real benefit in creating a specialization just for the standard allocator. The other thing is Microsoft don't have all the language features this relies upon yet, and I'm not sure how much of their <laughs> degradation was due to their workarounds for not having variadic templates and a few of the other features as well which is why I'd really like to hear from the other compiler vendors. But no, we've not done any, ourselves any extensive compilation testing with, against new, new code and old code with the different models. Uh, with what we do internally, it's been perfectly fine for us. But we're on the old 3 models still, with our own allocators. So allocator propagation I spoke about earlier. This is what I get from combining two halves of a slide. You get, might find we're repeating things in a couple of places. Gotchas with the new allocator model. One of the things I first tried when I started writing test drivers for my home, homegrown implementation of this was, let's have allocators that return smart pointers that the, from the memory that the allocator's given them. And the end result is the allocator and the smart pointer are actually fighting over ownership of that memory. So there might be some model out here where that works, but I've not found it. This just leads to trouble in lots of crazy, strange places where you might not be looking for it. So the advice is, the smart pointer that you return from an allocator should be a random access iterator, but it really shouldn't be a smart pointer that thinks it owns a memory. And the other thing is stateful allocators need to share state. You're making lots of copies of these because that's the allocators propagate through the system. But if you're then, make, say, I've got something like um, the B BDLMA buffered sequential allocator, and I stored that buffer within the allocator object, if I make a copy of the allocator object, those two allocators can't exchange memory. This is why you create the, the buffer outside the allocator and then those two allocators are sharing a reference to the same piece of memory. So stateful allocators share their state. They don't have their unique state or any unique state they have can't affect their allocation behavior. So that's The allocator is part of the type. In C, in C++11, yes. With our BSLMA allocator, BSL allocator wrapper, which isn't the name of the one we actually proposed for the standard, but that's got uh, N3525, I think, is the document. You'll see there's a proposal for how to provide polymorphic allocators that use our set similar, a class similar to the base class I just showed, and it also has adapters to adapt a regular allocator that isn't derived from our allocator to create an allocator derived from our allocator that just forwards the methods appropriately. So even legacy allocators can be adapted to work with a polymorphic model if that's what you want to do. Yes, the default allocator in our model is new and delete. I mean, C++11 STD allocator is still STD allocator. It's just hardwired to do new and delete, yes. So the question is, what was the, um, the, the default allocator in C++11? The default allocator is still STD allocator. It's still just hard codes new and delete. And again, you can plug in your different allocator types. The thing is now we've, now we've removed the weasel wording, the different allocators that you plug in are actually going to work. <laughs> 
And again, we have a proposal for one kind. Um, I was talking to Frank Beerbasher at uh, the ACCU conference in the UK, and he's saying this thing with the allocated traits is exactly what Boost needs for the shared memory containers. So again, Boost wouldn't need its own implementation of the containers. They could just implement a shared memory allocator, and that will just plug in the right way by default. I've got a slide on that towards the end. Uh, what time am I supposed to finish here? I think it's about now, unfortunately. 2.10. I've got 10 minutes. Fine. So this was the important one I wanted to get to. What's it like to implement a container with the new model? So here I'm implementing what I call DynArray before a new DynArray was added to the standard last week. The idea is it's, um, I'm going to dynamically allocate an array up front when I construct the container, and then there's no insert and delete. It doesn't change its size. It's just a fixed size at the time I did the construction. So I'm going to have two type, take two type defs internally. I'm going to take the, an, an alias for allocator traits because I'm going to be using these allocator traits all over the place. And likewise, it's really nice to know what pointer those, the allocator traits wants me to work with because it might well not be a raw pointer. So let's take a look at implementing our constructor. First thing we're going to do is we need to allocate memory for our um, copy of our initializer list. So we go to the allocator traits with a call to allocate pass it our allocator, and this is the number of objects I want you to allocate. C++ allocators still prefer to work in the terms of the number of objects rather than, rather than the number of bytes. Um, then I'm going to take the address of the, the first object coming back. So now I've got a raw pointer to the array of memory that came out. I'm going to go through a for loop, um, again, going through allocator traits to construct the element at each address. And if an exception occurs, I'm going to likewise go through and destroy all those elements. And again, release my memory. Again, you'll notice any attempt to go to the allocator goes through allocator traits. Any attempt to get the address of an object, I'll go through the new standard address of function just in case some crazy person gave me a type overloading the address of operator. I hate those guys. But we have to support them, so this is kind of the model of what you end up implementing. address of on the allocator. So the question is, is there a reason I'm not using the address of on the allocator? And no, allocator traits don't supply address of. It's a separate function in the memory header. So it's one function template in one place rather than being many instantiations of the same sp kind of function. But there is still a bug here, which was reported to me time before the last time I gave this presentation. No, because the order of construction and destruction here is well, well defined. If the construction fails, I don't try and destroy that same element. The language takes care of that, and I'm only destroying as many elements as I have constructed. Now, the bug is the assumption I gave at the top, that this was actually a valid assumption to make, that I can just take the address of the first element from the smart pointer. That's giving up the benefit of the smart pointer being a random access iterator that lets me walk through the memory. So if, rather than returning me a pointer to an array of that many objects, it's returning me some kind of data structure that it knows how to work with additional bookkeeping on each element. I've got it wrong. So in the end, this is the correction. I'm now saying auto put is equal to data, so data? D under data. Yes, I'm missing a D underscore there, thank you. So I get back whatever kind of smart pointer I allocate, I walk through the um, loop now using incrementing the smart pointer because that knows how to do its navigation and my calls to address of are now within the loop. So this is actually how I would have to implement this. But if we go back a, a slide, the fact that this is an error turns out to be a real problem for vector.data where it assumes that has to be correct. So. You're now currently looking at a standard issue I need to, a defect report I need to file against the C++ 11 and 14 standards. Please don't write allocators like that. I hope to outlaw them. So that, that should be valid, but currently you, you are required to write it like this. Question at the back. Uh, 
Yes, I, uh, I am destroying in the order I allocated them, not in reverse order. This was another question that was given to me last time. So the question for the uh, camera is, what, am I destroying these in reverse order? No, I'm destroying them in the order I constructed them. And that was indeed raised as a potential bug last time I gave the presentation as well. So that's what that should look like. Thank you. <laughs> well anticipated. And actually, you'll see this code's e uh, even actually slightly easier than the previous code to, to iterate. So it's actually a nicer implementation. But th this is the notion of you write your containers. You're now using allocator traits and passing all your methods to, that need to work with the allocator or do the construction of the object to the allocator traits with the allocator rather than going directly to the allocator itself. So it is a change in the way we should be writing containers now that we're moving into C++11. Question at the back. That's an optimized, yes. The question is, what about not running the destroy call at all in the case where I have a trivial destructor? That's an optimization I didn't show. That's exactly the kind of thing you would write there. And it's, it's not that the cost of the destructor is high, it's saving me walking the loop, and that's the real saving there. So, final part of the C++11 allocator model. We've got this additional type trait called uses allocator. And what this is for is, this lets me know if the type I'm constructing uses an allocator. And sometimes we want to use allocators for objects that don't dynamically allocate memory themselves. So the classic example I have here is tuple. Is this on this slide or the next slide? So, typical case is, as I said, we've got the scoped model where we would like the elements of a container to use the same allocator as the container itself. So I've got a vector of a tuple where the tuple has strings. So when I construct the tuple, I want to be able to pass the allocator to the strings in the tuple, even though the tuple itself doesn't need the allocator. So the tuple now has each of its constructors are overloaded, so they can also take an allocator that they can then pass to each of their elements if the element needs it. Um, we can denote that by specializing the user's allocator trait, which will sniff out, first of all, is easily if it can spot, do you support allocation? And otherwise, if it spots the user's allocator trait, it will again throw, go through the construct call when you see uh, dispatch the construct to say, I will actually pass the allocator to the element I'm constructing rather than just directly constructing it in place. And the other feature we have is a new header in the standard library scoped allocator adapter. And the idea for this is to say, this is how you'd implement a container where the elements in turn want to use the same allocator as the container. You would actually use a scoped allocator adapter if your allocator becomes the allocator for the container and the allocator for the elements that go in. And then the same allocator just automatically propagates down through the system. That's what the scoped allocator adapter does. In fact, this is way over general because it will take a parameter pack of allocators to say, the next allocator down goes to my elements, the next allocator after that goes to their elements, and the next allocator after that goes to their elements. But when you get to the last allocator in the chain, that's just recursively used all the way down. So typically we expect only one allocator in that list. And a typical place where you would use this, in addition to using the BDE allocator model, where we like all our containers to have the same, the elements to have the same allocator, is if I'm doing something like memory mapped allocators. So something like the boost shared memory containers. So first of all, you notice I've put this into namespace memory mapped. And then I'm creating a couple of simple type defs. So I'm going to have my mapped allocator is a simple type def of my class declaration is going to be the allocator that does all the shared memory work. Then the actual allocator I want to be is my default allocator within the memory mapped namespace is scoped allocator adapter or mapped allocator of my type. So this is an alias template. Then I will alias something like standard vector and basic string. So I will have a memory mapped version of these within the memory mapped namespace where I'm substituting this scoped allocator adapter as the default allocator for containers of the same name that are aliasing the standard container but from within this namespace. So then finally I can do something like um, a memory mapped vector of memory mapped string and boom, I've now got a vector of strings that are all in the memory mapped using the memory mapped allocator by default. And yes, it's a little bit funny putting these things into the namespace, but I think having looked around at a couple of variations on this using the C++11 model, if you're trying to change your default allocator, do it in a slightly different namespace, but adapt the existing containers, and the model works actually out fairly neatly.
trying to provide the scoped allocator in each of the different places ends up looking quite messy. And that, that I think is my last slide on technical stuff. Quick summary. Who needs to know how to write allocator traits? Basically standard library vendors. There's about a half dozen people in the world need to actually implement that horrible allocator traits template I was showing you. It's great fun for recreation if you want to learn about templates, but please don't think this is a, something that we want the world to know about. Who needs to use allocator traits? Well, anyone who's writing a container now in the C++11 world should be dispatching to allocator traits to do all their allocation behavior. And I believe allocator traits are now available on all the major standard libraries. Who needs to write an allocator? Well, clearly anyone who needs to know how to write an allocator, anyone with specific use cases where they need to write the allocator for their purpose. Also kind of handy if container authors know about this so they know how their container with going through the allocator traits is going to map to the user-defined allocators, but they, they don't need the same in-depth detail about it. So finally, who needs to know how to use an allocator? We claim just about everyone. They're a really useful feature when, now that we have them properly supported and available. And hopefully we're going to see more a more um, smarter and variety of allocators coming forward now that C++11 supports them properly. And that is the end of the slide. Final presentation, the Bloomberg allocators are one possible application of the uh, C++11 model. In our model, everything derives from BSL and LMA allocator. That way, all our allocators interoperate. Allocators are passed by address. The important thing is the allocator is no longer part of the container type, so we get the vocabulary problem solved. We can pick our allocators, therefore, for each object, pick the most appropriate allocator in each use cases we need. And yes, we pr proposed this for the standard, and it was quite well received at the uh, Bristol meeting. So hopefully that will be going forward for the next standard library, TS. And we're done. Questions? The standard supplies only uh, a standard allocator, which uses new and delete, and scoped allocator adapter. That's all we have at the moment. Oh, could, could you repeat the question? I'm not quite sure I got it. Okay, so the question is, if I'm dealing with something like a vector that is going to do the occasional big allocation to say I'm going to allocate for my current capacity and then all my, I'm just doing lots of construct calls in there but I'm never having to go and allocate so there's not lots of dynamic dispatch, few virtual function calls. I'm implementing something like a map or a set and I'm doing lots of small fine-grained allocations for each node. Does the cost of the dynamic the virtual call matter to us there? Um, Hard to answer because one of the things we've done is an optimization within our own implementation of map set and the unordered containers is we actually have a node pool that was useful whether or not we had the virtual calls. But again, it means that we're not seeing them there. If you look at our implementation of list, I don't think we're seeing a performance overhead from it. Virtual calls are something that compilers know about, optimize well, and compared relative to most of the other behavior of allocation, that it's a negligible cost. with adaptive
are so good, and you get them all the time, automatically, you don't have to ask for anything. It's like, you know, that's the way to go. But, but absolutely, if you've got a lot of small objects, and you, you want to create them together, you want to do it as fast as possible, allocate them all, you know, provide the, the sequential, uh, buffered sequential allocate to each one, and, and they will be created and destroyed faster. So maybe it's the last question, I'm afraid, because time's running on us. So the question is, typical thing, when we have a standard allocator, it defaults to new and delete, and that's going to the underlying mechanisms in the operating system itself, the, the standard C library, malloc, free, these kinds of things. And is there any way we can leverage that in C++ or get a fix down at that lower level so that you know, we, we get better allocation behavior in C++ without having to go through all this? And what we're seeing is there's definitely been a lot of progress over the last decade or so with you know, multi-threaded allocation behavior with the default news and deletes. So the default, alloc default allocation from your system is a lot better. But this, once you have that extra bit of context, is usually that better as well, a bit better as well. So the gap has narrowed. And if you want to take advantage of specific things that you know about your specific system, you can write a custom allocator to take advantage of that rather than use the standard default that just goes to new and delete. The trouble with replacing new and delete is it's global. Whereas we're trying to have something that's context specific where you've got even more information to really exploit the advantage of your known behavior. But yes, having a better default allocator for the cases where you don't have specific guidance is a good thing and the, the systems are improving. Well done.